Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the European Business Aviation Association, EBAA, I would like to welcome you all to our AirOps webinar series kickoff today. We're happy to see that even though we can't meet up physically, everyone in our sector remains hungry for more knowledge and to be the best they can be in their respective fields. And that's exactly what AirOps Europe is all about. It's about offering the business aviation support community a platform to strengthen its competitiveness, to deliver best in class client and passenger experiences. To those of you who are not members of EBAA or those unfamiliar uh, with us as an association, we are a non-profit association based in Brussels in Belgium and we've been ex in existence since 1977. We're proud to be the voice of the European business aviation sector and represent over 700 member companies and organizations spanning the entire value chain of the business aviation sector in Europe. The association's mission is to enable responsible, sustainable growth for the business aviation industry and doing that in enhancing connectivity and creating opportunities. Despite the COVID-19 wrecking havoc throughout the aviation sector, one thing remains clear. Business aviation has been able to connect the world when it was needed most, thanks to its support community. And this industry is lucky to have a support community that takes pride in its flexible, secure, and most of all, resilient nature. The COVID-19 pandemic that set the tone for the second year in a row now has shown to all of us the importance of traveling safe and secure. Now we know, we're well aware that the FBO world and flight planners have been hit just as hard as everyone else in the business aviation industry. However, and thanks to their additional works on checks, procedures and analysis, we've been able to claim the markets as being the most secure way to travel by air. Business aviation and specifically all the people in the flight planning and handling world have been able to show the strength of our industry and indeed its resilience. Now I'm also happy to say that we will have an online presence from Eurocontrol officials over the upcoming series of four, four webinars. We continue to enjoy an ever closer cooperative relationship between our organizations. And I want to thank Eurocontrol for its continued support and for helping us in informing our members on the latest developments within the sector. Importantly, I would like to thank our sponsors for the entire AirOps webinar series. Thanks to their support, we're able to hold this year's series. So a very warm thank you and token of gratitude to Skylink, UAS and MyAirOps. And to all of you who are with us today, I wish you a fruitful session this afternoon and we hope to see you back over the course of the next few weeks. I'll leave the floor now to my colleague and EBAA's Chief Operating Officer, Robert Baltus, to take all of you in today's program. Once again, thank you all very much. Robert, over to you. Well, thank you very much for your warm opening and uh, welcome, Atar. AirOps 2021 is now officially open for business. And even though we miss being in Brussels to engage with you, we at EBA are very happy that we're able to continue our AirOps this year. So thank you to all of those who have um, connected today. So why AirOps and why keep it going? So despite the fact that we are missing our in-person meet and the great exhibition floor we had during the last edition, the value of AirOps lies in the learning opportunity it provides. The business aviation sector is facing more challenges and opportunities than ever. And in this webinar series, AirOps brings to you the latest operational information critical to your job function. 
With the traditional event format having changed, we will be highlighting key priority topics for the industry. Today, we will discuss the state of play for airports and FBOs, what's happening on a statistical date, um, uh, from a statistical point of view. On the 23rd of February, we will discuss the consequences of COVID-19 and Brexit. Another week later, on the March the 2nd, safety management systems in ground handling will be our main topic. And on the 9th of March, with the support of Eurocontrol, we hope to uh, share with you the tips and tricks on planning efficient and flexible flights, which is crucial for our industry. Especially, specifically in regard to the two main destabilizers in our industry at the moment, Brexit and COVID, we are very happy with the member feedback we received in the last few weeks. Remember, you are the people on the ground that encounter issues that we want to help affiliate, uh, alleviate. EBA was able to help due to member feedback. So thank you for the feedback and keep it coming. I would specifically like to thank our main sponsor of the day, Skylink. Skylink Services is a well-established company providing specialized services for executive aircraft at Larnaca and Papua's international airports. They've been operating for over 20 years. The company has continually expanded and has an exceptional high reputation employing only experienced multi multilingual staff qualified to support all our customers, executives and professional requirements. And also a very important add-on, they are ISBA certified as well. But without further ado, I would like to introduce our first webinar discussion. The webinar will be on the state of play for airports and FBOs. What have been the consequences of COVID-19 for business aviation? And more important, what will be the challenges and opportunities going forward? We've bought, brought together the best data experts in the industry, as well as a flight planning company with a unique global perspective. So today I'm joined by Claire Leleu, which is the Stat4 Forecasting Manager at Eurocontrol, Richard Ko, Managing Director at WingX, Abdul Sharafeddin, Vice President Sales UAS uh, Trip Support, and our own Arthur Thomas, Market and Business Intelligence Manager at the EBAA. To start with, I would like to give the floor to Claire Lullo. Claire is a senior forecaster at Eurocontrol, European Organization for the Safety of Air Navigation, better known in the industry as the people that ensure that your flights around Europe are coordinated and planned in the most efficient and seamless way. Founded in 1960, Eurocontrol currently has 41 member states um, and is headquartered in Brussels, Belgium. Claire has run the STAT4 department, which stands for Statistics and Forecast, since 2012. And she is responsible for the delivery of objective air traffic forecast for every state in Europe and beyond. In that capacity, she is the lady who knows what is happening or currently not happening in the aviation industry in Europe before anybody else. Because of this, the EBA team is very happy to have Claire giving us a unique insight in the pandemic from Eurocontrol's perspective. Claire, the floor is yours. Claire, I think you might be on mute. Sorry for that. I just need to work out and come back one slide. Um, sorry. Okay, anyway, I will start, Robert, because you gave uh, the introduction I was supposed to give. You have already gave, given my name, my role, and I'm very happy to, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I, will, I will give you some insight about uh, how your control uh, aviation intelligence unit monitored the unprecedented COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So this presentation is twofold, and we will just jump into the subject uh, with this first slide. We will first address the, the trends. Uh, I have a couple of slides about the trends, and then we will also uh, investigate the forecast, what the future look like. Um, yes, so as a start, I, I just want to share with you uh, this graph. So this is the number of movements uh, in ECAC airspace, 
uh, expressed in millions, you can see on the y-axis, over the last 20, 25 years. So let's start where, where we were. In 2019, uh, it was the year where we recorded the highest number of uh, movements in European airspace, uh, more than 11 million flights. So think about it. On average, uh, every day there were more than 30,000 flights in the sky in a CAC, and, and the busiest day ever was recorded uh, the last Friday of June 2019, where uh, 37, more than 37 flights were airborne, uh, not at the same time, but on, on, on that day. So 2020 was supposed to surpass the 2019 levels, but this did not take into account a key player, the, the COVID-19. So as a fresh start, I want just to, to give you the opportunity to, uh, to, to get a little bit of energy for the start of this uh, presentation. I'd like to ask you uh, a, a question and, and have you um, uh, answering a poll. Um, so my question is, how many years do you think, oh, sorry, I just want to come back one slide, thank you. My, my question is, how many years do you think it will take for your control, sorry, for the European traffic to get back to the 2019 levels? How many years uh, will it take to get back to these 11 million? Uh, you have uh, three proposals, five years, seven years, or 10 years. So I, I let you answering this question. Um, and at the same time, I've just on this slide uh, mentioned the, the last crisis. Uh, the main two crises were the 9-11 in 2001 when uh, around 200,000 flights were lost and it took one year and a half to recover. And the second crisis was in, over the 2008, 2012 period with this uh, great financial crisis. And uh, the, the traffic took uh, about eight years to recover. So my question to you is, what do you think for this crisis? Uh, how long the hiatus will be? Uh, how long will it take for, for the sector to recover? Yes, so thank you for, for having given your, your views. I see that you are, you, are, you are very optimistic and I'm very happy to, to, uh, to have your views on this and we will, we will get some answers uh, or at least our views at your control in the coming slides. So uh, to, to move on, uh, at your control, we, we tried to... Um, yeah, sorry, there is a delay and I don't see my next slide. Um, I try to move forward. Okay. Well, sorry. So at your control, the Aviation Intelligence Unit has been uh, preparing many reports and analysis and data sets to monitor the COVID-19 crisis and presents, uh, present traffic statistics uh, at state level or at airport operate, uh, aircraft operator level uh, or about the air navigation charges. So every single, um, I would say, um, um, actor of, of the aviation system has been measured compared against uh, before COVID. Uh, we have been developing a series of uh, indicators, for example, to, to measure uh, the flight efficiency and uh, sustainability is a key subject now. So you will see more and more uh, measurement about uh, environment factors. Um, but we also inspected the impact at airport level. Uh, we also uh, had some different views on what was going on for the different the service providers. The INSPs were quite exposed during the crisis. Uh, I'm not showing here all the reports about the aircraft grounded or all, all the reports you could find. I think. The best advice for you is to connect to the link which is mentioned at the top of this slide and you will be able to visualize uh, some graphs but also to uh, upload, download some data to create your own analysis. So we have been also very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, you might have seen these, um, these daily uh, um, uh, snapshots and, and so I, I, I'm sure you, you, you will be able to follow, to follow them in, in the coming weeks. So to start off, um, the, the big picture, in fact. So this graph is showing the daily flight growth in March, uh, sorry, since March in Europe. And uh, each line here on this graph is representing a, a state. So at ECAC level, uh, no surprise. So ECAC for us is the, uh, Europe. In fact, uh, there was a big drop 
around the April May period with the lockdowns and all the boundary closures. Uh, airline reduced their capacities, grounded their aircraft, so you know all about that, and the activity was reduced to minimum. So only in fact cargo and, and repatriation flights were operating. There has been a start of recovery uh, in June, uh, from the June to September period with the summer, and low costs in fact were quite reactive. Uh, this graph shows the variety of declines. Uh, some states with uh, an important share of domestic traffic, for example, um, are, are recording less declines than others. For example, Norway or, or Santa Maria, the Azores on this graph. Um, because, of course, islands are highly dependent on connectivity, and so they, they could not afford not having any connections with the continent. At the other end, you, you have states uh, like Armenia or Israel with a high proportion of international arrival and departures or even international overflights. And, and in fact, they have been lagging behind. They have been recording uh, declines of uh, minus 70% uh, around. So the picture is, is less catastrophic for some states than for others. And overall, uh, ICAC, the ICAC state declined by 56% in, in 2020. Um, this chart is about all IFR movements, but uh, in our unit, in our service, we decompose or we, we classify the flights according to their market segments. Uh, we consider mainly five market segments. You can see them on, on this graph. Uh, all cargo go in blue, the low cost orange traditional schedule, the, the big network carriers in gray, the, the non schedule also, also called charter flights in yellow, and business aviation in red. Uh, that you, you are, um, I guess, familiar with. So uh, a few things to take away from this graph, which shows, in fact, the smooth growth of the daily uh, uh, flights uh, per market segment across the year. Uh, in March, uh, as, as you have seen in the previous graph, you clearly see the, the first wave of the COVID having an impact on, on most of the segments, uh, except cargo. And, um, and you see also uh, the, the second uh, wave from, from mid-November. Uh, just for your information, the blip you see uh, around Christmas time is mostly due to calendar effects. So it's a bit disrupting, but it's, it's not really uh, what to take uh, from. So the all cargo segment is the only one which was in the black, in fact, uh, in 2020. Um, I'll say, of course, we know the increasing importance of carrying cargo, and I'll say a few words about this in, in my next slide. Um, on the contrary, uh, you can see that traditional segment and, and low cost, they have been uh, very impacted, severely impacted by the crisis. Uh, but low cost demonstrated its uh, ability to, to restart very quickly uh, at the beginning of June with, uh, when the demand was, was there for, for summer flights. Um, I guess you are quite interested in, in the red uh, line for business aviation. This segment decreased by 24% in 2020 uh, compared to 2019. Um, of course, it was not uh, as smooth as minus 25% across all the year, but, but when the travel restrictions were lifted, uh, in fact, such uh, business aviation carriers managed to ensure the connectivity uh, between uh, the different states where, where the scheduled carrier couldn't, couldn't do that. So, but you'll get some, some more details about business aviation segment from Arthur, uh, Richard and uh, Abdul in, in the coming uh, presentations. Just for your information, there is a donut uh, which shows the market shares of these segments overall. Uh, and you can see that the business aviation market segment has doubled in fact. It was representing around 6% of the flights in 2019 and it now accounts for more than 11% of the flights. Um, let's have a quick look at cargo. Uh, as I told you, uh, cargo was of very um, uh, high importance uh, since uh, the COVID crisis has started. Um, this graph shows, in fact, that uh, all cargo, which is the uh, straight line, uh, is currently uh, recording uh, three to four times uh, more than their normal market shares in Europe. Usually cargo is around 3%. And you can see that uh, in April, it was accounting for more than 20% of the traffic. Of course, uh, you didn't have the rest of the traffic. So the importance of cargo, which was around the same volumes, uh, was, was uh, more important. But 
What we noticed also is that uh, cargo is such an important um, uh, actor in the aviation uh, world currently due to the increased demand in medical supplies, also the boom on, of e-commerce, that most of operators have started to uh, use their passenger aircraft to, to move cargo. Um, even if uh, we, we cannot really measure, me, measure that in, in normal circumstances, we are not able to detect the cargo in the belly hold, we were, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, able to detect from the flight plans the operators which were just feeling their passenger aircraft, as you can see uh, in the picture, with, their, with cargo loads. And, and this is the dotted line. This is the additional share, which is uh, um, uh, accounted from these passenger cargo aircraft. Um, there are also some very interesting uh, reports about the rankings, the airport rankings, because airports have been severely hit by the crisis. They had to adapt. They had to adapt to the new uh, sanitary measures. Uh, to to they are really uh, uh, the, the uh, connecting points in the network. Um, the blue bubbles are representing the ranking of airports in 2019, uh, around the March to September period, and the pink one are the 2020 rankings per, per airport. The size of the bubble is the size of the traffic there in average daily departures. Um, just for your information, you have airports like, for example, Oslo, which uh, entered the top 10 thanks to this uh, high connectivity uh, dependence and the fact that there were a lot of domestic flows which had to fly uh, through PSOs uh, in, in this state. So I can let you investigate more, but there are many, many interesting graphs you, you can find in, in our own um, uh, dashboards. The last one in terms of trends I wanted to share with you is about emissions. Sustainability, as I told you, is very important nowadays. So we are able now to produce some maps uh, and you can see that um, the travel restrictions due to COVID pandemic led to much reduced CO2 emissions. Um, in fact, if we follow the global standards, uh, the CO2 emissions are usually uh, assigned to the country of departure. So that's the way we represent the, the CO2 emissions. And, and these departing flights overall uh, decline uh, by, sorry, the CO2 emissions of these uh, fly of these states have declined by 54% compared to 2019, um, which is a, a little bit, uh, well, it's in fact similar to the decline in flights. But of course, you can see on this map that there are differences uh, according to the states uh, because of uh, uh, different mixes in terms of fleet uh, for the different uh, states. You can see that, for example, Belgium has not declined as much as the others, but, but Belgium is also um, uh, highly um, represented in terms of cargo operations. And these uh, cargo uh, uh, aircraft are quite big. Um, and um, so, in fact, they usually fly longer distances. So it's why, in fact, the minus 30 percent is maybe less favorable to, uh, to, um, to Belgium. OK, so let's jump now to the second part of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to introduce the forecast, which has been prepared uh, in September, October last year in 2020. Um, just after the summer, Europe, European traffic had declined by 65% over the March to October period. And here we were, we were supposed to start and plan and, and anticipate what will happen over the next five years. So we have prepared a forecast to 2024. Uh, and, and of course, COVID had a strong impact on tourism and economy, hence on aviation. Uh, of course, most of our forecasts are relying on economic uh, forecasts, but the relationship between the economic growth and the air travel growth was quite disrupted in, in, in these circumstances. So we have built three scenarios, three independent stories, if you want, uh, and, and we have considered the following items. Um, the fact that at the time we were preparing this forecast, we were at the start of a, a, re, a, a second wave, so hence we would have had some travel restrictions coming in, uh, we would have had some um, uh, new decisions from CEOs of airlines to, to park their fleet, to lower their capacities. 
Um, we have also been in touch with the pharmaceutical industry to understand when the vaccine would be available, um, when would it be widely available, and you will see it is one of the main um, uh, inputs in the, in the stories of our scenarios. And um, we have been also considering, of course, the economic uh, development, uh, and, and there were possible scenarios there from a financial crisis to a more quick, a quicker rebound, but also there was the, the Brexit uh, question mark at the time we were preparing the forecast. So we have been uh, anticipating these into the scenarios. And, and finally, we are uh, highly aware, as uh, we were discussing during the preparation of this meeting, that the propensity to fly, the fact that travellers will maybe never fly again as they were flying, that uh, a portion of uh, travellers, for example, uh, uh, elderly people, will be maybe more cautious to travel, uh, that all the video conferencing uh, tools now are, have somehow um, uh, removed some, some demand, but we have been anticipating how it can evolve. So this forecast was prepared um, in collaboration with uh, a, a group of uh, experts, the Stat for User Group members, and here are the three scenarios we have created. So I will just go quite quickly through the slides because I, I'm conscious of, of the time. But basically, on the left hand side, the scenario one is the most optimistic and uh, is expecting that the vaccine would, would be widely available, made available for travelers by, by summer 2021. Um, so in this scenario, uh, there would be enough testing facilities. Uh, the passenger confidence would be restored quickly, uh, low-cost airline would be uh, able to re-inject some uh, capacity on the network when the demand is there, and, and, and also the intercontinental flows would be restored quite quickly. So this is the first scenario. The second scenario is, is a bit of the same story, but shifted one year. So the second scenario expects the vaccine to be made widely available to travelers by summer 2022. Um, it's the most likely scenario, and you can already feel from the current times that the, the speed of deployment of this vaccine is, is taking time. So it's still the most likely scenario. Um, and in this scenario, um, we, we would expect, in fact, that the traffic levels would get back to 2019 levels by 2026, which is a seven-year hiatus. The last scenario, uh, the most pessimistic one, is also um, depending on the fact that the vaccine would be made available in summer 2022 to all travelers, but the uptake would be patchy. And, and in some places of the world, it wouldn't work, or there would be places where you wouldn't be allowed to travel. So there would still be this lingering effect infection due to COVID and the passenger confidence would be quite um, uh, attacked, I would say. So in figures, uh, you, you'll find this graph uh, in many of our communications. So you, you can still retrieve a free scenario, the green one being the scenario one. Um, you also see in the, in the yellow squares, um, the level of recovery to 2019 level. So as I am telling you, uh, the scenario one um, expects the traffic to recover to 2019 level uh, in, in five years. And this is most of your, um, I would say, thoughts or, or your, your poll uh, expects the scenario one to be, to be uh, the winner. But in the end, you can see that we are currently more uh, in, in line with the scenario two. Uh, the passenger uh, confidence hasn't been restored anyway. There are many travel restrictions. So um, currently uh, we, are, we are more in line with the orange scenario, which expects seven years for, for the recovery to pre-COVID levels. Um, there are many risks surrounding this forecast. I, will, I won't go into deep details, but basically, uh, as I told you, there was the Brexit uh, um, risk, which was surrounding the forecast and which is still there, there are now some uh, some more progress on this but but uh, it can still have an impact on on uh, on this uh, transition period uh, just for your information in terms of routings 
the, the forecast anticipates that uh, the routes which were used uh, in 2020 would remain the same. There, there were mainly the, the most direct routes which were used because the traffic was low, the, all the restrictions on the network, the road restrictions were lifted. So basically, the traffic was quite fluid and, and very, uh, we'd say, direct uh, in 2020. So we expected these routes to, to continue to, to be operated. But of course, we, we are not able to anticipate the, what the aircraft operator are, have in mind. Um, and finally, yes, there is a lot of uncertainty around the economic recovery. So this is it. Uh, you will be able to find uh, through this presentation, you have links, all the details through uh, this report, forecast report, the dashboard I've just introduced. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to have opened this uh, session and I leave the floor now to, to my colleagues. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Claire. Um, I think that was a very interesting insight from Eurocontrol. Um, on the positive note, there seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel. I think we're just not sure how long the tunnel is. I think that's, that's the takeaway there. Um, just another comment, Claire. I'm very pleased to say that the, the Twitter updates you're referring to um, by Eurocontrol are very well received. That allows us to unlock data on a day-to-day -day basis, and it gives us um, very useful immediate insights. Now, with that, I would like to go over to our next speaker. Um, ever since he was young, uh, Arthur Thomas uh, developed a no nurtured uh, passion for aviation, which to this day provides him with the greatest source of uh, inspiration. Arthur is based at the EBA office in Brussels, where he is the market and business intelligence manager, a lot looking after anything to do with data from, uh, the Euro for, for the European Business Aviation Association. What a lot of people don't know, um, is that Arthur is also the official air and space painter in the French Air Forces. And I've taken the liberty of putting in an extra slide without him knowing and taking the liberty of showing some of the excellent pieces of work that he created. When I joined the EBA, I thought there were photos only to find out they were painted. Anyway, today Arthur is here to take us through some of his data. And with that, Arthur, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so do you hear me well? Yes, I guess. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very, I'm very happy to be there uh, for this presentation uh, with, uh, with my colleagues. Um, that's always a pleasure to do those presentations um, because state of industry presentation are to some extent always uh, interesting uh, given the size of the market, given the, the, the very nature of business aviation as an industry. But uh, if, if we take into account this, uh, this, this, this pandemic uh, and its effect on the industry, uh, this, this, this sort of presentation has become even more interesting than ever. Um, so what I will not do here, that's a small disclaimer, I won't be uh, analyzing um, the market, I will just be describing the market. Uh, there are tons of reasons for that. Uh, the biggest one is, the main one is that uh, Richard will speak after me, will be uh, the, the guy analyzing uh, the market better than I could do. Um, but so I'm just gonna bring you uh, some, some small uh, information on, on the, the way uh, the industry has been reacting throughout 2020. So what, what you see here in this first uh, slide is uh, the comparison between 2019 and 2020. And so that does not come as a surprise, obviously, but uh, once uh, the pandemic started uh, mid-March, the first week of March, in fact, um, we have seen the traffic decreasing a lot. What we have here is business aviation traffic only. Uh, and so you see that uh, you see this 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 big first uh, wave uh, happening in the in the business aviation uh, sector uh, as a result of of the first uh, wave of the pandemic, with a slow but certain recovery up to the summer. And uh, we saw uh, surprisingly, but that uh, business aviation was back to normal levels uh, during August, for instance. And then the second wave uh, hit uh, Europe and the world. And we have seen this second uh, decline in the, in the traffic up to December. And uh, December was kind of 
flat again and the third wave as uh, as it uh, and so we really see uh, this uh, directly uh, reflected on on the traffic so that's what you can see here if we compare with airline though so you have those two curves on the screen here uh, the purple one being the business aviation curve and uh, the blue the dark blue being airlines and so we really, really see here uh, the, the, the big difference, the big gap. Uh, uh, the way those curves are calculated, this is just a comparison of uh, a specific week of the year versus the same week a year before for both industries. And you see that uh, when business aviation um, has fallen uh, at the worst at minus 76% around the second week of April, um, Airlines were at minus 90, 94%. And, and, and we see that uh, business aviation has been kind of more um, as, as a stronger kind of reactivity uh, to, 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 to the COVID than airlines that are this big, huge uh, machine that uh, is never, never supposed to be stopped. And so when this, this, this art stop happens, it's kind of uh, really, really tough to, to get back. And so what you see here is kind of a first illustration of, of the flexibility of business aviation as, as an industry. That's the white picture. Uh, so what you see here obviously is the dominance of red and it obviously does not come as a surprise uh, that uh, the business aviation ecosystem has been uh, negatively impacted. Uh, by the COVID crisis, and um, yeah, we 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 tend to hear there and there that business aviation is a big winner uh, out of the of the COVID crisis. Uh, I think this kind of chart shows you the contrary. Um, it's been less drastically and dramatically impacted than the airlines, obviously, but uh, you see that uh, around pretty much all the European countries, business aviation has been hit uh, by uh, the COVID crisis with different levels. And this uh, first uh, map that you see here, uh, you will see the kind same of, of uh, diversity in the, in the following charts and following maps, because uh, you see dark red, you see light red, you see flat and you see green colors. And that's pretty, that's pretty yeah, illustrating uh, this, this, this craziness that's taken over Europe with the COVID uh, and the fact that more than ever, um, the reaction has been at the state level and uh, aviation is not a state level industry. So that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna explain why you have all those different colors and the different ways uh, the countries have reacted. Just for you to know, the, uh, the European average is minus 26% uh, in 2020. So you can compare uh, the different countries with this uh, average. Uh, France, for instance, being exactly at uh, the, the average. Uh, Germany being uh, at minus 19% only. So having better reacted uh, in terms of business aviation, I mean, uh, than uh, the Europe and uh, UK, for instance, UK being uh, drastically impacted at minus, uh, minus more, plus 30%. So a small animation that uh, shows pretty much the same story, but from an airport perspective. What you see here mostly is all those different colors. You see dark red, you see light red, you see yellow and you see green as the indication of uh, how this 2020 specific year was at uh, those airports. What are those airports here? Those are all the airports having more than one flight a day in business aviation. So you have here around uh, four, 500 airports. Uh, if I was to put all the business aviation airports, so all of the airports used by uh, business airplanes, at least once a year, you would, you would have three times more dots on the map. But this is kind of the map where business aviation uh, flies every day. And you see this kind of diversity once again here uh, with some, yeah, some airports that were really, really um, uh, dramatically impacted, uh, minus 30% uh, compared with 2019. And you have some airports that, that had 
better reaction and some airports that are even a better year than 2019. Uh, so that's that's kind of complex to you know to explain uh, because basically there would be a story for each of those airports and uh, and 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 I guess uh, if there is one takeaway from this kind of slide, it would be that uh, business aviation proves here its huge flexibility uh, because you would not expect uh, to see green dots basically. So. That's what I can say about a uh, kind of wide landscape for those airports. If we look at uh, the segmentation of business aviation uh, in terms of types of missions, uh, so in EBA, we split the industry in four big categories, uh, the commercial business aviation, air, tra uh, air taxi, charter, air charter business aviation, uh, the non-commercial, which can be the purely private business aviation or uh, the corporate business aviation and that's, uh, that, that could fall under this, uh, this, this non-commercial segment. And then the two very specific uh, parts that are medical and special business aviation. So uh, Medevac and things like this. And the last one being the state slash diplomatic uh, flights uh, that, that are a different, uh, a different segment as itself. But what you see um, on the right side, this is that obviously the two being the biggest components, uh, commercial and non-commercial business aviation were uh, strongly impacted, uh, non-commercial being the worst. And what we see here is that um, a medical and special business aviation has sort of kept flying throughout the year. Uh, it does not come as a surprise. We all saw those stories about uh, medical and, uh, and, 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 and doctor transportations and, and repatriation and things like this at the beginning of the crisis. So business aviation has been at the, at the, at the forefront in terms of, um, in terms of uh, answer to the COVID. Um, but we see here that commercial and non-commercial were really, uh, really impacted. And... Uh, uh, the last thing to remember is that when we talk about the recovery of the industry throughout the summer, uh, it's, it happened mostly in the commercial uh, business aviation. And uh, we have seen a lot of charter flights uh, happening in the, in, in the summer. I guess my, my colleagues after me will, will explain this. Exactly the same graph, but now it's not split by type by uh, missions. It's split by aircraft type. So again, in EBA, we do a kind of simple segmentation of the industry. Five different types of airplanes: the turboprops, and then uh, small jets, medium jets, big jets, and very big jets. And uh, I think that uh, the right uh, the right side chart speaks by itself. The bigger the airplane the other it was. And uh, that's, that's kind of clear, very clear, that's transparent on the slide uh, and on the charts. Uh, whenever we talk about the business aviation recovering, whenever we talk about business aviation driving the way, it was done by turboprops and light jets. And um, for all those in the industry that are mostly into big jets, it's been a pretty tough year. And uh, we really see it here. Uh, so the, um, yeah, the big operators operating heavy jets and doing uh, long haul flights, uh, this is really, really a bad year. And this is reflected in this chart. Just a short uh, overview of um, the intercontinental connections. Uh, so if you look at uh, those uh, different regions, so those letters, uh, if, if, if you wonder what those letters are about, uh, this is the very, that's the very first letter of the four letter ICAO codes for those airports. Uh, well, so that's it. And um, you see here different stories. Um, you see as well that uh, obviously the big uh, connections uh, between Europe and the rest of the world are first Russia. Uh, Russia and, uh, and, and post-Soviet states, North America, obviously, and, uh, and Africa. And uh, you see that, uh, obviously, all those things were drastically impacted. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at, for instance, uh, United States, uh, it's plus minus, uh, it's, it's over minus 50% uh, uh, on year. So this is really a proof that uh, this, this transatlantic component of our industry has been, has been impacted very, very deeply. Uh, this is a small animation. Um, so this animation is very nice, but I'm sorry because uh, due to the streaming, it won't be run smoothly on your screens, but you will find it anyway uh, afterwards on EBA social media. This is just an evolution of the rankings uh, of the business aviation airports from 2010 onwards. And so you see the, the story of, of those main airports and the way they have changed their ranking over the years. What is very uh, interesting is to see that uh, you really have those uh, top five airports that are really leading the way. All of them being uh, around the 30,000, 40,000 flights. But when we arrived in uh, 2020, uh, it, it has fallen uh, to, to 20,000 flights. Uh, so that's a pretty, pretty interesting um, I would say story to see, uh, nothing really to, co to comment there. Um, but uh, I wanted to show this uh, because that's, that's, that's kind of a good overview of, uh, of the business aviation ecosystem as well from an airport perspective. Those are the top uh, airports um, in, uh, in Europe, so really, what you, you saw uh, earlier the, the, the slide with all the airports uh, with more than one flight a day. Here, this is really about the big uh, airports, uh, those who are having a lot of business aviation traffic. And you really see here uh, the impact uh, of the COVID on, on, their, on their specific reality. Um, so the airports that are depending uh, on the long haul flights are are really impacted as you can see with this nice, with uh, paris le bourget with farnborough and luton for instance um what is to what is to to be understood here i guess this is the last uh, column i just added yesterday with the average flight distance and what you really really see here is a shortening of all the flights um I don't exactly know if it says uh, something very clear, but uh, when you took when you take into account thirty thousand flights, uh, an average decrease of two hundred kilometers means a lot, and uh, this really shows the um, the reduction of long haul flights and uh, the fact uh, during the fact that during the COVID crisis, uh, business aviation was more than ever about short uh, short connections. Uh, and the last slide for me, this is uh, to show the main routes of business aviation. I showed you the countries, I showed you the airports. Now uh, let's see the, the routes. Uh, this is the top 30 business aviation routes in 2020. And um, what you see here is some very interesting uh, phenomenon. And they are very hard to explain. And uh, once again, as it was the case with those airports, there is, uh, there is a story uh, about all, each of those routes. Sorry. Up. And um, so, voila. W what is eventually to be seen here is that uh, I have put in blue in the, in the table the, the, domestic, uh, the domestic routes. And what we see here uh, is that when it's domestic, it was less impacted which shows that uh, more than ever in 2020, uh, business aviation happened domestically and, uh, and the cross-border flights were more impacted, which does not come as a surprise because uh, the border were closed, et cetera, et cetera. And this closes my presentation. I'm gonna leave the floor to, uh, to Richard now. Thanks. Well, before we go to Richard, thank you very much, Arthur. And I think people have found your presentation at, uh, as equally uh, impressive as your paintings. If you are an EBA member, you will be probably using some of the excellent work done by Arthur already. For instance, the EBA yearbook, but we also have the excellent ESTAT dashboard that puts the most important traffic information at your fingertips. So you can manu manipulate the data yourself. So if you're an EBA member, make sure you go to the EBA website, check out the ESTAT uh, dashboard created with data from 
Euro control and wing X. And um, if, you know, if we would like to learn something about it, do reach out to uh, the EBA team. On that note, we move on to uh, a gentleman who uh, I think needs no introduction if you have been in the business aviation industry for a few years. Richard Goh is Managing Director of WingX Advanced GmbH, based in Germany, and he founded it in 2011. The tools that Richard and his team created for the business aviation market use a wise, wide range of marketing customer data to create performance dashboards, like the one we have, which allow competitive positioning, support decision making, and improve business development. In short, Richard is probably sometimes in a better position to reflect on your own company than you are yourselves. So customers include everybody in the supply chain, airports, ground handlers, operators, etc. And Richard had senior roles in the consulting, telecom and manufacturing industries, but fortunately realized that there is no business like business aviation business. And that is why we're very pleased to have him as the next presenter on business aviation activity trends. Richard, the floor is yours. Brilliant, Robert. Well, I really want to can that introduction because it's just one of the best, uh, most flattering ones I've heard. I can't stand by every word in it, but uh, but thank you all the same. So I think um, your colleagues are going to introduce my slides now, I hope, um, unless you want me to upload them. I think you've got them and you're going to introduce them. Brilliant. OK, well, let's move on to let's move on to the first slide. There we go. Brilliant. Um, Okay, well look, what WingX is doing is tracking flight activity globally. Um, so we're doing that uh, right across the commercial cargo um, and ad hoc space, um, everything from, from, uh, from rotary to, to passenger airlines. And of course, you know, focusing um, on business aviation. And by business aviation, we, we, we cover the spectrum from, from VIP biz liners to, uh, to your standard business jet platforms and, and the props and the business pistons, the, the twin pistons. So that's the, uh, that, that's the sort of scope of our coverage. And what we're doing is looking at that on a daily basis and, um, and understanding from that, analyzing from that and understanding from that, trends which we think are important for our customers across the uh, supply chain. So I wanted to start with this chart because what those three graphs along the bottom show is the 2020 picture. In fact, it goes all the way through to the start of Feb 2021. And the, uh, the color is, is the 2020 and then a little bit of 2021 versus 2019 and a little bit of 2020. So you can see that scheduled aviation has had an enormous chunk taken out of it and has had a very modest recovery. The business aviation has recovered rather well. Um, and that, uh, as Claire was reminding us earlier, Claire, uh, cargo traffic on a, on a global level has indeed increased on where it was pre-pandemic. Um, actually, if you look at 2021, so we're just looking here 1st of Jan through the 9th of February, um, scheduled aviation, that is the passenger airlines, continue to be a long, long way behind um, where they were pre-pandemic, at least 50%. Business aviation, if you look at it globally in that first, just over a month, first six weeks of 2021, is just 8% behind the, uh, the, the same period in 2020. So um, a very big contrast there in terms of the resilience uh, of, of the BizAv recovery, even though we will see it differs uh, from region to region. Let's, let's move on to the next page please. So from region to region indeed look at the contrast between North America and Europe and uh, what those uh, rather bright red boxes tell you is that in the um, well the less the less red is the BizAv picture so North America so far in 2021 we've seen just under seven percent decline same period 2020 Whereas in Europe, that decline has been 25%. Respectively, in, in the scheduled airline services, it's minus 48% and minus 71%. So North America is indeed proving to be uh, you know, a more resilient market. And I think that on a day-to-day -day basis, we all get reminded of that because Europe is in a, is in a constantly changing mosaic of lockdowns and um, you know, clearly crossing any border is complex, if not illegal. So it is not surprising to see this divergence. 
um, but it is remarkable all the same. One, one thing I would say, though, is that if you look at that purple line on the chart, what that represents is BizAv um, sectors as a proportion of all fixed wing sectors. And you can see it's actually been pretty resilient. I mean, Claire was saying earlier that in Europe, that share has doubled and that's, that's more or less um, represented in the chart on the right. Actually, on a global basis, um, BizAv has gone from around about 9% of all global sectors flown on fixed wing aircraft to about 16%, up to 30%. At the at the height of the pandemic, so that gives you an idea of the sort of the global resilience of our industry in terms of utilization. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so I've got a kind of multi-regional view here. So these um, these charts in in the foreground, these six charts in the foreground, are, are the, essentially the 2020 picture goes a little bit into 2021, um, and uh, you can see that you know the color up front, the blue is is clearly you know some way uh, behind the, uh, the the previous year. This is in terms of hours, in terms of flight hours. I think the interesting thing I'd pull from this is that if I actually had the numbers showing, which I'll add, Asia has in 2020 seen the biggest of any regions decline in flight hours. Not so in sectors, but in flight hours, in, in business aviation flight hours, Asia was, uh, the Asia region was, was over 30% behind um, 2019. North America and Europe, for 2020, we're both around about 25%. It's only as we got towards the end of, of 2020 and into 21 that North America has, has continued its recovery and, and, and Europe has not. I've got the little chart on the top right, which you're, you're probably gonna find very difficult to read, so I'll, I'll enlarge it later. But basically what it shows is that in 21, in those six weeks, five weeks, six weeks of 21, we've actually seen an increase in BizAv activity in terms of sectors flown in, in Oceania, which is really, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and in South America. So that's that's really quite interesting. Let's move on to the next one, please. So a selection of European countries. And what we've done here is looked at the 2020-21 um, the period again, and we looked at BizAv and scheduled on different axes. So the purple is the, uh, is the BizAv uh, left-hand axis and the black, the scheduled. So you can see everywhere, you know, even in a region that's, that's really taken a hammering in BizAv as well, um, the, um, the BizAv uh, activity has, has generally outperformed the scheduled activity. I've got the two green dots there to show that latterly in, a, in the last few months, we've actually seen more BizAv in Russia and in Turkey than pre-pandemic. So that, that's really quite a, a takeaway that those two countries have seen such a such a strong rebound or really you know sort of consistent throughout the crisis but now really growing in terms of sectors flowing more than, than than before the crisis the uk has been the worst hit the uk is currently actually in the last week just to bring you up to date the uk is is, is down 65 percent in terms of biz out movements over 85 percent in terms of schedule so you know, Brexit plays some part in that, but I think that, the, you know, the lockdown policies on borders are clearly um, really stifling any recovery in, in BizAv in the UK. Besides the UK, Germany and France down by about a third, Spain and Italy down by 15 to 20%. The other country we've seen take a real knock in terms of BizAv um, at the moment so far this year, Switzerland and Austria, because of course they've lost their, their ski season, so they've lost their, those, those high-end leisure uh, flyers. Right, let's move on to the next one, please. I wanted to show you a few of these charts just because they bring out some interesting, uh, some interesting points. And you know what we've done here is we've looked at scheduled and and BizAv flying from um, certain cities. And what we're looking for is like, is there any erosion? Is there any sort of crossover where we can see, you know, scheduled is 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 really sort of falling behind? Is even kind of dropping connections altogether? Is BizAv growing on those uh, on those sectors and there are a number of interesting examples you can you can possibly look at later because you'll see that the trends are side by side in the in the table and most of the the growth um and there's really strong growth from from flip for, for, for many connections um is uh, is actually on 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 bizav uh, and it's on sectors which which uh, on many sectors which were previously flown uh, or served by schedule sochi is one example I mean, Sochi has seen really strong growth in terms of BizAv connectivity uh, and, um, and, and the contrasting decline in the scheduled service from Moscow. Let's move on to the next one. And I'll show you a couple more examples. So, you know, Ankara, um, 
Aster, which of course is, is now mostly GA. Um, but again, you know, we've seen a real, um, a really, a really solid resilience and indeed growth as shown by the, the green circles. I should, I should add that green means, means growth and on our, on our maps and the size of the bubble is representative of how many flights. So for example, you know, we've seen really strong growth from, uh, Ankara to places like Belgrade, Dalaman, Bodrum, Tirana, and, uh, you know, where those, where those locations are served by schedule, it's, it's greatly diminished. If we look at the next one, and I think this is Munich. Yeah, it's from Munich. Okay. So a couple of interesting ones here. I mean, I was, I definitely noticed that Olbia, um, was interesting because it has such a strong growth in, in business aviation. It's obviously an important destination for, for, for German tourists and the scheduled traffic has, has all but disappeared. And indeed the connections, the scheduled connections to Cologne, Hamburg, Baden, Baden, completely gone and they're replaced by business aviation connections. So, you know, that's, that's, I think a really important theme where these airlines are simply dropping connections. It seems that BizAv is going to fill some of the gap. Let's move on to the next, please. And that's the last one. That's from Vienna. Um, and again, you know, it shows, shows some connections, which, um, where scheduled is, is, is almost completely disappearing. Um, and BizAv is, is filling the gap, Prague, Linz, Belgrade. So yeah, this is an interesting chart because what we've got here is a view of what's really behind some of the resilience in BizAv and it's charter. I mean, it's, it's the ad hoc chartering <coughs> of aircraft, which is, um, which has been driven by the branded charter companies that is is clearly showing the most resilience this is a 2020 view apologies for the small numbers but you know effectively what it shows is in 2020 in the us the branded charter operators were flying just eight or nine percent below normal um and in europe 16 percent below normal 16 percent below might sound not so great but the whole market was down by 25 percent. so you can see good resilience in the charter market and indeed so far in 21 the US charter market is actually up 2%. So that's quite a staggering statistic that the, that the, um, the charter time in, in the US so far in 2021 is higher than it was same period in, in 2020. Europe, 16% uh, down, that was as of 9th of February, more resilient than the overall market, but not showing any great recovery. Let's move on to the next, please. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to to take a look at what's happening at the unit level. So this is just this these two charts basically capturing the number of active aircraft. Okay, so we can identify how many are how many aircraft are active in the system. Um, this is a quarter by quarter view. And what's interesting here to us is that the number of active aircraft um, has has decreased quite a bit, twenty five percent in the in the charter market. Um, so, you know, they're simply, they're simply not active Q on Q. If we look in, let's say Q4 20 versus Q4 19, but the productivity of the aircraft that are active is actually higher than it was pre pandemic. I've got that, uh, bloody looking chart at the bottom there. Uh, that's, that's VLJ operations since Jan 20 into 2021. And, um, it's a little bit unclear where December is, but you know, there's a December period just before the end on the right there where VLJ operations, charter operations were up 10%. So that means higher than they were in December, 2019. Let's move on to the next, please. Um, just looking a little further afield, I mean, you know, we, we are obviously talking about the European market in, in this series, but you know, the North America market is, is showing us, I think that um, operators can, um, you know, can really thrive even during this, this, uh, this very, very turbulent volatile period. I mean, you know, we've seen FlexJet, um, which, which I'm sure you, many of you will be familiar with. We've seen it increase its operations um, above and beyond where it was pre-pandemic. And, you know, it's clearly using a, you know, a, a series of tools which, which are proving effective. You know, it's got a, it's a group now around directional, which has a lot of broker feeds. Um, it's, got a, it's got a sort of, you know, it's got a mixed set of products for customers uh, and it's able to feed its fleet and actually fly more than it did before the crisis. Wheels Up likewise is, you know, agglomerating a number of different operators, many of which have actually, um, you know, have actually shown some growth during a pandemic. Wheels Up recently acquiring Mountain Air. In Colorado, which has consistently seen growth um, as, a, as a leisure destination through 2020. 
Let's move on to the next, please. Okay, so I just want to sum up the presentation looking at some of the bigger picture uh, questions um, because, you know, it's, it is it is just such a difficult one to forecast and I, and I, and I wish I had something as, as impressive as, as Claire's. But I think, you know, if we were, if, what we're trying to balance up here is just, you know, known unknowns, right? So the top two charts show us that, okay, we've got a reflating global economy, um, we've got cheap money, we've got, this rebound in sentiment, if you look at the PMI index, it, it looks it looks relatively good. It's why, you know, the IMF in their latest uh, up in their latest forecast are actually sort of improving the, the, the recovery outlook. But then, you know, on the bottom, OK, so we might get economic recovery, but are we going to get travel? Are we going to get airline travel? Interesting chart on the bottom left. There, that's from McKinsey. And it shows that um, over the last 20 years, each time when there's been a crisis, this is a US view. There's been this much bigger lag in biz travel recovery um, as opposed to leisure travel. It's really leisure travel again that is kind of holding the industry up since the pandemic. Nice picture of, uh, of old Bill there. He's basically his he's, he's widely known quote is that fifty percent of business travel will simply disappear. It won't come back at all. Um, let's move on to the next, please. And I wanted just uh, just pick up a couple of insights we found interesting in, in business aviation, this one around leisure. So as we're talking about the kind of, you know, the importance of the of the leisure traveler, if indeed the business traveler is gone or at least halfway gone, we looked at, at Christmas time, um, at this Christmas period between the uh, 18th and the end of the year, saw this really strong increase year on year in activity on certain days running up to Christmas. And indeed this continued in early January. So, you know, what we might be seeing is actually more demand than ever for business aviation over much more, you know, much more seasonal restrictive periods. Um, because, you know, during that period, we saw, uh, and, and this, is, this is the period 18th to 27th, we saw a 5% increase in global business jet activity. So it just shows, you know, once the, uh, once the lockdowns are released and certainly during the leisure, season that the, the high points we could see a real rebound if we just next one please um this has been mentioned a few times what this chart is just to explain the different numbers what we're doing is we're comparing the number of unique pairs served by <clears throat> served in europe this is a european picture served by bizav compared to scheduled and, and we know that this is a really important part of our industry that we that, that the bizav is offering significantly superior connectivity to scheduled um we, we it's just simply the versatility of the business that is able to serve so many more pairs but what's interesting is how that is changing and this really is a sort of macro view of what we're seeing from those individual airports that in q4 2020 we saw a 32 percent increase in that relative advantage of bizav over scheduled so you know we we really see this as a strong theme moving into 21 and beyond let's move on to the next please um, okay, so, you know, one of the big questions is we've had newcomers come into the industry in 2020. Um, and we know this from many different operators uh, and brokers who are seeing, you know, 50, 60 percent of their requests coming from newcomers. We're also seeing a lot of new owners come into the industry. You know, Jetnet is, is recording, amongst others, that the Q4 period for pre-owned jet transactions was, was simply, you know, broke the ceiling, it broke new records. And actually in 2020, there was a 5% increase in pre-owned transactions compared to 2019. So, you know, there could well be new newcomers coming into the owner market as well. Uh, inventory for sale is, is around 8%. So, you know, that is not indicating a recession in our industry, in, at least in terms of uh, in, in terms of the aircraft trade. In terms of new business jet deliveries, again, you know, JetNet shows there on the right that 2020 was, was you know, was created as, it, as the Americans like to say. I mean, it was a 25% dip in deliveries, but 2021 is, is not looking so bad. I mean, it might be 15% down, but, you know, we're, we're on a road to recovery there. Business aviation industry sentiment is really strong. Uh, the bottom left chart I, I, I snatched from Alistair's CJI report the other week. It shows over 90% of attendees were optimistic or very optimistic about business aviation. The, the, the monthly Barclays report, which is a great one if you, if you can access it, which is, which is polling the industry, has seen the strongest, uh, and that's the bottom right, the strongest sentiment in January 21 that it's seen since 2018. And, and JetNet's regular surveys 
say the same. We, we, we've got stronger sentiment across the industry, and that's operators, owners, suppliers, um, than in twenty uh, than in twenty twenty nineteen. So let's let's finish with a couple of charts now, looking at what we see as you know. I, I would divide them as kind of cyclical and secular. Okay, so what is the kind of industry recovery prognosis um, in twenty one? And and I would you know I would say there are at least a couple of, of smileys here, and I think it's you know perhaps it's too trite to use the word because it is really around the health hazard that we're seeing this shift towards business aviation because you know the the the, the vaccination is not necessarily going to be the magic quick ticket. People will still be very concerned about the the the, the hygiene hazards of, of flying, or certainly even moving through any congested uh, locations. So business aviation will will benefit from that. We've got the countervailing economic recession, um, which which could become very serious and could certainly stifle that recovery. But then we've got the connectivity issue, which as that corporate traveler starts to come back in, is going to be very important in BizAv. If we could move to the next one, please. Just want to give this view of where we see global business aviation activity in 21 versus 20 versus 19. So we don't see a recovery to 2019 at this point in 2021 but we reckon we'll come pretty close this is on a global scale i've given you some idea of the regional breakdown there on the right uh, we for example we, st we we think in europe you know there might be 11 percent more business aviation sectors flown in 2021 but there'll still be 15 percent down on uh, on 2019 if we move to the last one please robert okay so you know the big picture is are there, and I'm sure this is, you know, sort of grist for a lot of debate today, what are the secular changes that could completely change the positioning of, of business aviation? And, you know, for me, it's basically it's a counterweight between, OK, what happens in terms of, you know, economic risk and uncertainty and deglobalization, because that's been an important uh, uh, catalyst for business aviation. What happens as business aviation struggles with this sort of environmental tag? On the other hand, how much more uh, how much more appealing does business aviation become as it defines itself as as an on-demand transportation space that, that fills some of the gap left by the scheduled airlines okay i'm going to finish it there thanks robert excellent thank you very much richard and i think the main takeaway i have is that uh, we should be glad to be in business aviation not commercial aviation productivity is higher for some fleets specifically the smaller ones charter branded or not seems to be leading the way so at least that's a very positive uh, trend of actual data and um, hopefully that will um, pay itself off going forward next we're very pleased to have on the panel abdul sharaf Hedin, vice president sales at uas uas international trip support we're pleased because with almost 25 years of aviation and management experience Abdul is a seasoned industry veteran who currently is responsible for U.S. global development and sales effort. People attending the last AeroOps in Brussels must have met the UAS team as they had a stand at the event. And now we're glad to have Abdul virtually here. We've just listened and were able to see all data behind the trends in business aviation and hence at the FBOs in Europe. But we now have the chance to get a more practical approach um, a practical perspective of the pandemic pandemic from a company that has to organize the permits fbos and sometimes much more and we're very interested to learn about how they went through the different phases of the pandemic with that welcome abdul the floor is yours thank you robert for having me here hi everyone um no doubt there has been uh, serious challenges for um operating flights around the world and a lot of the the rules and regulation has changed and uh, continue to change um, basically, um, what we have right here, um, I have with this presentation together to give us uh, some understanding or some insight onto what has been happening uh, in the view of uh, operation perspective. Um, what I will cover in this presentation, um, about some of the summary, summary here, uh, chaos. Basically, frankly, I could not find a better way to uh, describe what have uh, what everyone has been experiencing in 2020, and um, and. Um, Later on, the uh, other than it's like it's a total chaos, basically. Then uh, we'll have the organized chaos, and where in this phase we will talk about little uh, about the actions has been taken to support the interruption of aviation flights and services. 
then what becomes the new normal? Uh, we can see everything has shifted 365 degrees almost, and there's a feeling we are getting uh, used to it, uh, as I think. Um, and what uh, are some of the uh, takeaways? This is simply shows that best practice have been done or we have seen uh, during the pandemic and um, to avoid any risk. And then finally, I will present a, um, uh, a case study uh, to give us um, some of the, the, the problem that happened and how, how we managed through it. Talking from an experience of a trip support provider where we have um, the privilege to be in the front line supporting thousand flights during the pandemic. What I've experienced is unprecedented and I don't really recall or have experienced anything like this. Uh, what we have really witnessed, um, border disclosure, border closure and that done basically to, to contain and stop the uh, virus from, from spreading. Also, uh, there were uh, different and uh, new uh, immigration rules for every country. And uh, in my opinion, or frankly, the, the challenge here is not the different immigration rules, rather they were really changing without much notice and were inconsistent, basically. Also, we have witnessed a total or a partial lockdown uh, and all the cases, this is, has limited the access to suppliers and amenities. Also, we see in the health screening uh, also presented a trouble in, a few, uh, in the first few months. And it's actually, till this date, it's still happening, where a crew cut uh, quarantine seven to 14 days. And um, so, as mentioned, it's still happening in a lot of countries as well. But we had to really adapt quickly and find a solution uh, to the problems. Moving too quickly with these slides. Uh, we experienced tough operating condition combined with a surge in demand. In 2020, we had witnessed countries restricting and su suspending flights with the exception of a humanitarian, cargo, repatriation, medivac. And this is what we've seen from the previous presentation that uh, basically those flights has been uh, boomed a lot. However, planning the logistics such as refueling, crew rest, pickup, drop off remain uh, a massive headache for many uh, missions. Also immigration, um, immigration restriction, many airports reduced their operating hours, especially in the, in the first uh, half of the 2020, and did not really have any manpower or budget to maintain a full complement of services. It also um, was a challenge to keep the ground time to maintain um, or to limit the exposure of passenger and crew um, to, the, to the virus. Here we see um, uh, some of the challenges impacted uh, on general aviation. Of course, the whole pandemic was a huge impact, but like, you know, what really was troubling for flights around the world. Quarantine for sure. For business aviation, it would be critical to get international acceptance that aviation crew can enter and exit countries without being put into quarantine. Um, parking at airports got overloaded. Uh, since the commercial airlines grounded uh, their aircraft, it's created a chaos and overloaded parking in most airports. And a large number of aircraft were blocking parking spots, especially in small airports, like if you're talking about Hong Kong or in Asia in, in particular. Um, also, aircraft parked there uh, got exposed uh, to high threats from uh, typhoon, if you, re if you remember from uh, May and uh, till almost like November, the typhoon season, like, you know, so a lot of aircraft parked there, like, you know, got exposed to the, uh, uh, to harsh seasonal uh, weather conditions. And of course, like, you know, we see the same thing happening right now in, in Europe with the, uh, with the current uh, ice and uh, snows. MRO support, almost impossible, uh, especially if the engineer had to fly uh, commercially, where they are facing travel restriction and a quarantine. Another impact was on crew licensing, uh, training, and uh, expiry issues. As we know, pilot has mandatory recurrency uh, proficiency regulation to fulfill. And um, uh, so this is also has been impacted uh, the, uh, on, on the GA. Uh, crew rest, we had, especially in, um, in the first half of 2020, and it's still happening uh, for some part of the, the world, where we had situation where 
crew were not able to get enough rest or quality rest, some unusual experience as well. Like operators had to fly with two sets of crew and some sleeps on the plane. This is something unprecedented, of course. But again, we had to adapt uh, quickly and um, find a solution. Um, our global operations team really had, had used their um, problem skills to solve uh, and become incredibly creative in finding um, situation. Um, now we, we see the, the, uh, the organized chaos phased phasing, which is a majority of the repatriation has been done by commercial airlines on a charter basis. And also business jet has got their own share, uh, as, as we understand. Uh, US supported hundreds of those flights, repatriation flights all over the world. And we had dealt with all type of chaos have uh, mentioned earlier. We have been pretty much involved and worked with all stakeholders, whether embassies like for diplomatic clearances and diplomatic uh, assistance, charter operators, broker, and so on. Um, supporting ambulance flights, the rules did not really change for crew operating medivac and we had to get a special approval or exemptions for many flights and it happened on uh, the country of operation. Get an emergency and medical uh, suppliers, um, there, there uh, was enormous demand for quick delivery of medical sanitation, uh, sanitization supplies and pharmaceutical. And uh, we understand that uh, grounding the commercial airline has um, created a massive demand for cargo and charters. We had also experienced, this is something unprecedented, like supporting business jet, carrying PPE and medical supplies. Likewise, we have seen airline use it as well, as mentioned in our earlier presentation, passenger cabin for cargo purposes. It's worth uh, to mention as well here that the entire supply chain, uh, if we have seen in, uh, in, in uh, especially in China, from the, uh, the entire supply chain has from the factory to the aircraft was complicated to process and this was the first uh, time we had to consider to um, the, the to see the to reconsider the whole entire process and not just typical aviation pinpoint the uh, prioritizing to covid-19 prevention measures um, uh, we had to ensure comprehensive covid protection protocol were implemented by frontline staff, such as uh, US station managers, supervisors, or our, our uh, preferred global network as well. This is uh, some of the, the pictures, like, you know, for the uh, repatriation on a business jet. Um, so uh, they had to play their role as well. Um, now what the, the new normal, uh, what we had in 2020 has become the new normal. I guess uh, we, uh, one thing I can really uh, see that we have learned how uh, to clean up better. But for the first time, we should expect this for every flight um, uh, to operate, increased cleaning and sanitization, facilitating touch-free transaction where possible utilizing PPE equipment. That this become a, a man, uh, mandatory by authorities maintaining social distancing at all times, training staff on illness prevention and sanitization on a going on basis, minimizing a person to person uh, contact. For um, the uh, what take away from the 2020, uh, first, uh, we need to understand that regulation are still changing daily. Um, entry requirement needs to be checked daily with trip support providers and local authorities. Much of the uh, published data, and this is really important, like in idea, much of the, uh, the published data uh, is already outdated and many sites or organizations are reporting conflicting information. Uh, there are differences between entry requirement laws and guidelines, and we see this quite happen quite a lot of uh, often, like, you know, you know, with operating confused between the two, what is required and what is simply a best practice. Um, also, it's a uh, expectation should uh, be uh, properly set. Info is going to take longer. This is we see we see that like you know because it's not updated and definitely uh, there's uh, changes on a daily basis. A red tape is going to be thicker. Uh, processing going uh, to be slower. So all in all, we um, we really have to be more patient. Uh, having said that, basically, um, what we are, what we have experienced, and what we uh, recommend, we have seen a, a lot of operators in 2020, and based 
um, using a single provider for all the services because this is the best practice in 2020 where uh, they have experienced uh, receiving conflicting information when using too many providers. So uh, uh, operators start using a single uh, provider. A global network, uh, having the right people on your side. Again, it's all about information, streamlined communication channels and dealing with the global uh, environment and health of offices has not been easy in 2020. Having a special team or personnel just to work on gathering information or outsource, outsourcing uh, this task to an agent or a trip support basically will ensure uh, or will, will, will ensure the safety for the next flight operating. Um, communication, again, correct info is a key here and uh, one has to stay up to date with information changes and this will require resources and speed to ensure having the, the latest uh, update. Um, also, we have seen, uh, spoken earlier as well, like you know, we've seen the business aviation was not a priority. Despite the role of business aviation has been playing uh, in the aviation industry, and during the pandemic, basically in 2020, it's still not given the priority or attention in many countries. This is, uh, will take us to the uh, case study that will wrap up everything we have seen, uh, we have uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, we had an operator from um, South Asia, basically. I'm not gonna mention the operator name or the intended country for uh, privacy. Uh, basically, we had an operator from South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia wants to, uh, their aircraft um, uh, laid in, in maintenance in Basel to be ferried uh, home country in Southeast Asia. Basically, the, um, there were a lot of concern that we, we were, uh, had thought about before uh, this ferry. The operator own crew could not travel to Basel for, for sure. The lockdown in Switzerland, as well as in the home country of the operator uh, during the, uh, the ferry and tech stop crew could get stuck in quarantine. So we had to take that also into consideration. The flights by commercial to Basel and back home. This is a concern like, you know, we had to um, uh, consider as well. The whole flight uh, should be delivered in one day, you know, bearing the circumstances like, you know, and um, the impact, and we don't want to take any risk or, uh, so we had to really deliver it one day. And basically the whole thing uh, was, has to be done in, uh, in four days in total. So um, the solution, we have, after we thought about the whole thing, like you know, we, we managed to find uh, a three FAA pilot from the US. And after a huge uh, of amount of research, we have discovered a way to get that crew to Basel with a special arrangement. The crew flew to uh, Zurich from the US on a commercial flight. Then uh, they had to ensure that they travel when, with their uniform and um, have their valid IDs uh, and licenses. It was really crucial for them to carry a written statement explaining their mission and duty uh, were arranged uh, by, uh, by the maintenance. And this is of course for the immigration when they reach the airport, not to give them any hard time. The crew had to be picked up from uh, Zurich and immediately transported to Basel and the aircraft, um, uh, to the aircraft. And we had, and within two hours, they had to really fly straight away because there's no time to waste whatsoever. Um, we arranged a special uh, meet and assess services for the crew uh, arriving to Zurich to facilitate uh, ease of entry and also arrange uh, disinfected ground transportation to drive them uh, from um, Zurich to Basel. Uh, we ensured also the aircraft was ready to be flown uh, out of Basel when uh, the crew arrived. This meant that they had to leave the country within only two hours from arrivals. At this time, mostly uh, most countries did not allow crew stop overnight. Uh, this this flight was, uh, took place in, in April. So the crew had to make a quick fuel stop. Uh, we have selected Dubai because this was one of the, the countries or the cities that, uh, that was open at that time. I was able to welcome uh, tech stops. Uh, it was impossible for any crew to enter into the destination so uh, once the aircraft landed uh, in the home country, a uh, crew had to take a commercial flight immediately. We managed to obtain an exemption from the home country immigration to allow the crew to arrive and by road drive them to the, um, to the uh, uh, nearest airport where they can take a catch up a flight uh, to another country. Uh, uh, during their stay uh, in the visit country, they were under immigration uh, escort all the time. 
because of the situation. Uh, then from the uh, from the third country, like you know, we have arranged a, um, a business class flight for for the uh, for the crew and flown back home um, in the U.S. Uh, the whole mission was successfully completed in uh, uh, on April second, basically, and client was very delighted to have their aircraft back home. Uh, I guess uh, that will bring me to my end of presentation. Excellent. Well. That was an excellent presentation, an interesting case study, uh, Abdul. And uh, the key takeaways that I've underlined are the communication issues, the resilience of our industry, and that business aviation wasn't a priority. And I would almost uh, like to uh, rephrase that into a more sobering statement. BA, business aviation is still not a priority. And this is also the reason why the EBAA really needs the support of all entities to ensure that business aviation remains on the agenda with your local governments, airports, and authorities. Now, because we're already reaching four o'clock, um, I thought we have a number of questions from the audience. So if you would like to stay around for another five minutes, um, I would like to ask some questions. Um, the first one would be for you, uh, Claire. It's a question by Simon Chien from uh, NetJets. And his question was, are the virus, variation in, the virus variations included in the second wave scenario? And I, I take it he refers to the more contagious uh, UK version or the South African version. Um, the, the variant, at the time we were producing the forecast, we heard about this variant. So they, they are not specifically taken into account. But in fact, uh, it's more related to the success of the vaccines, the vaccines. Um, some of them will not work because, because they are mutations of a virus. So somehow, um, no, it hasn't been taken into account. Now we are about to, to refresh, to update this forecast for publication in May. So we are currently reviewing these scenarios and, and learning from the, the last developments of the virus to, to, to have a better overview of the future. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, we had a question from Zoe Leiden. Hello, Zoe. Um, and I think, Abdul, you're probably uh, well positioned to answer the question. What's the view of the panelists about airlines requiring a vaccine tra certificate to travel? What are your views, um, uh, Abdul? Would it be a hindrance? Would it be a help? Um, what, and, and do you have any feeling for timelines? Because you're obviously in multiple uh, countries. I think... Um... I think it would be a hindrance, like, you know, it would be a challenge as well, like, you know, we, we don't want to have more red tapes. Uh, we already, uh, people get vaccinated and, um, and also the PCR, like, you know, uh, currently, like, you know, which it seems uh, pretty well going on. So just, uh, in for, because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be refused to, uh, to be vaccinated for some reason, one way or the other, we cannot force everybody to take that, you know, so certainly, I don't see really um, uh, the necessity or the, tr the airline to really enforce this kind of uh, rules. And I don't think really what will, what will happen eventually because everybody's been vaccinated like you know, for the most part. And uh, once we reach to the uh, herd immunity, then definitely things will get you know, safer. Okay, thank you for that. Then Richard, um, I just see a question coming in and that it is something that the EBA works on a lot, and that, and that is on the environment. Um, Andrea uh, Sbracia, apologies for your last name there. Don't you think that the environmental problem for aviation will be, become the main post-COVID problem? What are your thoughts? And, and is that taken into account what, what you hear when you talk to people in the industry? Excuse me. Um, yeah, it could become a, a. It's a very good question. It could become the. Um, it could become a big issue, and and to an extent, it sort of rhymes with the, with the other toxic issues we had from two thousand eight onwards, where there was a pretty swift economic recovery, at least in the U.S. But this, you know, real hesitance from corporations to invest in in corporate aircraft, uh, you know, around a lot of toxic issues, um, and I think. You know, this this could be much bigger and much and much more damaging. That said, I think there's you know there are clearly initiatives that this this industry can take. And I think as you know, to, as we're a relatively small industry, I think we probably got you know more versatility to do so. So it's, it's an opportunity too. 
Okay, thank you. And the last question I have is for Arthur. Um, you always create this beautiful yearbook, and the question was, when will it be available and where can people find it? Because that is the statistics bible for business aviation. Yeah, thanks, uh, Robert. Uh, so, yeah, we are currently updating the EBA yearbook. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with the yearbook, this is a compendium uh, of um, 140 different uh, infographics uh, with all the European countries. So you will have the snapshot of the business aviation ecosystem in each uh, European country for the top 50 airports and for the top 50 uh, most active airplanes type. So that's a lot of data and that's about 50,000 uh, data that are available. And uh, that should be available in a little bit less than two weeks now in EBA website. Excellent. So an extra reason to look at our beautiful website. Also a great way to contact us to see what's happening on Brexit, COVID, etc. Um, and if you're not a member, a great way to sign up to become a member and help us to advocate for business aviation, because that is what we do on a daily basis. On that note, I would like to end this uh, excellent panel based on the comments and questions received. I think it was very useful. We're already overrunning a little bit, so we cannot answer all the questions. Um, but if you would like, you know, send us an email and we'll try to get back to you one on one. The key takeaways I have, um, we are in the worst slump for years. Business aviation is still not a uh, priority for some legislators and governments. Vaccinations are key. Um, and let's not forget sustainability, as that will be the next big thing to hit business aviation after COVID. But on a positive note, I think when the market opens, the expected return for, to flying for business aviation is promising. We should be glad that we're in business aviation and not in commercial aviation. I think we should be ready for the roaring 20s, as some people call it. And the best thing I think takeaway is that it shows resilience is part of business aviation DNA. So we should be best placed for a return to normal business. With that, I would like to uh, let you know that the presentation and the whole recording will be made available online. Again, we would like to thank our sponsor Skylink, which is the prime handling agents in Cyprus that made this session uh, possible. And I can't say it enough, Skylink as an ISBEO approved facility, so you know your aircraft crew and passengers will be in capable hands. Um, should you have any questions, any remaining questions, let us know by email and we'll reach out. I would like to do a final pitch for the next Air Ops session that will be hosted next week. Same time, you have to sign up for it as well. And it will be on the post-pandemic and post-Brexit. So that is a very interesting, very topical issue we would like to um, um, talk about as well. And I would also draw your attention to, and we talk sustainability, the Sus Sustainable Aviation Fuel Summit. It's a very big thing, EBAA, together with all the main players in the industry, um, Gamma, NBAA, NATA, uh, and, and a lot of the OEMs, will host an event on the 20th of April. You can see some information online. Would love to see you there. On that note, one more time, thank you for the panel. and. Uh,